Management Building um, and have also been working in pelvic health, uh, pregnancy, and postpartum here at the outpatient clinic. I am Lindsay McBride. I am a physical therapist and I work at our Morrison outpatient clinic and I have been doing pelvic health since this past fall. Okay. I'm Liz Seneff. I'm a physical therapist assistant also at the Locust Street, and I work hand in hand with Pam and Morgan here with some of the pelvic health stuff. Very good. Thank you. And there are varying le levels of certification and all those kind of things that you ladies have that we won't go into detail with, but suffice it to say for people that are watching, um, Pam, Morgan, Lindsay, and Liz know what's going on as far as pelvic health goes. So they're going to be our experts today, and they are experts. And so I want to make sure we get as many questions taken care of in the time that we have allotted here. So um, let's kick those off. And as always, for those of you who are watching live, um, if you have any questions that pop up, please feel free to, to shoot those questions our way, and we'll try our best to answer them for you. So first up is Liz. So Liz, I'm going to I'm going to give you a question to answer for the folks who are, who are watching. Um, first question about pelvic health is what is it? So what is pelvic health physical therapy and what does it include? Absolutely. So pelvic health therapy focuses on the evaluation, assessment and treatment of the pelvic floor to improve overall function, reduce pain and improve quality of life. So you're going to hear us say pelvic floor quite a bit today, um, and your pelvic floor is a group of muscles that attach to the bottom of your pelvis, and these muscles support your bladder, rectum, reproductive organs, and they help to control the functions of those organs, such as urination, defecation, sex, and childbirth. They also help with trunk stability, balance, as well as blood flow throughout the pelvis and the lower extremities. Okay. That's a lot in that over yes. right there Very complex. <laughs> there's a lot happening down there in the pelvic area yeah okay so thanks liz and i, I so appreciate the overview and then i'm gonna have i'm gonna ask morgan to come aboard here for a second and we have a i have a couple things i want to run by you morgan okay mm -hmm. um so i want to talk about urinary frequency okay mm -hmm. so it's pretty common for people to urinate frequently right what's this called and what can pelvic health therapists do to treat it? Yeah, very common problem. Um, we call the increased need to urinate uh, urinary urgency. Um, a lot of the time it's a trained behavior. You know, since we were little, told our kids go to the bathroom before we leave the house, before we yeah. go to bed, anything. And we kind of adapt that as we get older, especially if we start to have some problems. Um, lots of people say, you know, I have a weak bladder, I have a small bladder. That's really a myth. Um, we like to call it kind of a sensitive bladder that we have sensitized ourselves to. Um, it's not always a problem, but a lot of times it becomes a problem later in life um, when we're pregnant, um, postpartum, that it's causing problems that we need addressing. So um, things that can increase sensitivity in the bladder, uh, on the inside of the bladder, we can be drinking or taking in bladder irritants that really upset the bladder and make your brain kind of really want it out. So you feel that urgency increase. Um, or if we just go all the time and our body is used to just barely filling, it sends that response as well that you've, you've got to go to the bathroom. Um, and we've just kind of trained it to go so quickly. Uh, and that can be a big problem. I think a lot of people don't really know the bladder norms is something that we don't necessarily talk about all the time. Um, so just some norms so that you don't, you know, get into more of a problem is going every three to four hours. Uh, seems like a lot, but seems like, seems like a long time for some people to wait, but for other people, it seems like I'm only going once a day, you know, so there can be problems on both ends. Um, we like to try and say five to seven times a day and going eight to 12 seconds at a time, which seems like a lot, but that's kind of to know that you're allowing enough filling to happen. You okay. should be going so that we don't have the problems with the reflexes and body telling you, you need to go. Okay. So uh, the, the other part of that was, so how do, how do you guys treat that? What, what, what's the typically you do to try yeah, to help come up? admit I'm, I'm a sensitive bladder person. Well, here you like go. Before this, before this broadcast, I kind of did the, well, just in case I better go. Yes. Oh, yeah. I just so got logged out. How would you just treat someone like me? So, um, sorry, I just got logged out. Um, there's a lot of behavioral modifications that we can do. Um, you know, and that's where an in-person eval is really helpful, uh, to kind of find out each person, you know, what's really going on in your specific case. 
um, if we're, we call it chicken, just in case pain, we kind of try and tell you, you know, did you really have to go time the amount of time that you went? Um, did you hit that normal mark or do we need to kind of allow you to let it fill a little bit longer? Mm. Um, we can do some urge suppression drills, some distraction, um, mm -hmm. or is it thing, you know, are we getting enough fluid? If we're not getting enough fluid and we're drinking lots of coffee, yeah. um, then that's irritating to the inside of the bladder and it's going to send those signals off, you know, asking you to go to the bathroom. So there's some floor bladder irritants. We call them the four C's caffeine, carbonation, citrus, and cocktails that are really going to upset the inside of that bladder and tell us we need to go. Mm, I'm three um, for four on that one too, Morgan. So yeah, well, there problem. you go. So you might have both <laughs> kind of going on. Um, so getting enough water, a lot of times I tell people to do like a water sandwich, you know, drink water, dilute the inside of your bladder and you won't have that urge as often. Um, but also if you've trained your body to barely stretch your bladder, um, you, trying to tell yourself, no, I don't have to go right now. Do some distraction techniques before you leave um, and try and get on that, that better three to four hour mark. It's not always a problem, but if you start to have some leakage, that can become a bigger issue. Yeah, good. Good to know. I uh, appreciate that, that information. Um, so let's talk about something uh, regarding uh, female incontinence. So um, let me get, I, I kind of logged out here for a second too. You probably could see me, but I can't see you now. Um, anyhow, um, female incontinence. Mm -hmm. So in other words, um, leakage, right? Mm -hmm. um, tell me what, talk about the types and then talk about what uh, you can do as a um, physical therapist, a pelvic health therapist to help women with that problem. Yeah, we see this all the time. And especially like what we were just speaking about, um, that is called urge incontinence. Um, so we have two main different types of incontinence and we have a mixture of both, which most people have. Um, there's an urge incontinence and a stress incontinence. So urge is when you're having an involuntary bladder, bladder spasm, um, it, which is causing leakage. That's when it gets to be a problem with what your behavior is um, or what you're ingesting. Um, so we really need uh, to kind of retrain your brain. Uh, whether it's that stretch response that we talked about, teaching you to go a little bit longer, um, getting some more water intake, which can be scary for people that are having leakage because they're not wanting to ingest more. But if you're not ingesting enough, we say half of your body weight in ounces a day should be in liquid. Um, and then two thirds of that should be water. Most people are not getting that, but that's kind of a good base to start. Um, especially if you're leaking, we want to push that, that fluid intake. Um, and teaching you distraction techniques um, and decreasing those bladder irritants. Then, sounds counter, it sounds counterintuitive. It does, and we, but we still don't do it. Or you don't know those norms. You know, there's, it's, it's a hard thing, and that's a lot of bladder or pelvic health we don't really talk about. We, you know, no one talks about how often they go or mm -hmm. if they go three times at night and don't know that that's a problem. Mm -hmm. um, but when it gets to have the incontinence, you know, we really need to advocate for ourselves and ask for help because there is help. Um, on the other end of that is stress incontinence. And that is leaking during physical effort, like coughing, sneezing, jumping, laughing, um, which is very common. Um, and a lot of times that's a pelvic floor abdominal dysfunction. And it can be linked with the urge incontinence. You can have a mixture, sure. um, but we have some reflex dysregulation there too that we need to control. If we're not strong enough in pelvic floor or if pelvic, pelvic floor is too strong, um, you know, you can have some leakage. So it's, the answer is not always a Kegel. You know, that's a lot of times we hear, just do some Kegels. Mm. Um, but you might be too strong and those Kegels might be hurting you as well. Okay. Um, there's a good study that I, I talk to patients about all the time where women were just instructed in how to do a Kegel. They were just told, um, given a handout, um, and of those only 60% were doing them correctly. And the, actually 25% of them were doing um, urinary incontinence promoting techniques. So not, we're trying to help, by telling yeah. them how to do it, but we're actually doing it backwards. Making it, making it worse. Yeah, so that's where that in-person evaluation is really beneficial. Um, it's vulnerable to do and to talk about, but we're really trying to, you know, help people. It's a big quality of life thing. So, yeah. And I like the idea that you could do that in lieu of surgery sometimes. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. At least start 
you know, at least learning some techniques. And if you're not, if you don't know the techniques, you know, maybe it would help a little bit that can get us a little bit further. Yeah. Good. Well, thanks a lot, Morgan. I'm going to move on to, uh, to Pam, uh, Pam, you want to pop on here? I'm on. Okay. Hello again. Hello. <laughs> okay. Uh, a question for you. Um, I may, I may be butchering the pronunciation of it. I don't pronounce right. it well either. <laughs> <laughs> um, coxidinia. Um, yeah. If I said that somewhat close to being right, um, yes, what yeah. is it and what can yeah. your what can your team do to help with it? So let's call it tailbone pain. Um, I like that better. To say. Yes. <laughs> um, and okay. basically what that is, is, you know, we we can have pain in the tailbone. And how, how does that relate to pelvic health? Well, basically, many of the pelvic floor muscles actually insert into the tailbone. And so that's kind of their posterior insertion point. And so if imagine we have fractured our tailbone or hit our tailbone hard and irritated that. Now, muscles have a tendency to do one of two things. When there's pain, they either guard and protect or they decide to take a vacation at that point. And so what can happen is, is if you're having tailbone pain or you're irritated your tailbone and now those pelvic floor muscles, if they pull on that, it hurts mm -hmm. to avoid using them. So that can create a lot of pelvic health issues. But in addition, you can continue to have that tailbone pain because you don't have either those, those muscles are tugging the tailbone and kind of tucking it underneath, or they might not be doing much of anything and that tailbone doesn't move or almost gets blocked. And so as far as pelvic health, we teach you to either relax or use those muscles again and allow that flexibility of that tailbone. And if you think about where that tailbone is, it's at the end of our spine. And so oftentimes what people will do is when you sit, we kind of tuck our tail, right? And so they might find sitting as very painful and they can't sit for durations of time because they don't have that flexibility and that just irritates it more. So we try to find that mobility. We might use mobilization, soft tissue techniques. We might just teach them to contract or relax those muscles and allow that movement and incorporate the rest of the spine into extension and flexion. And um, by creating that mobility, that allows it to function better again. And yeah. um, then they can be much more comfortable in yeah. many more things and kind of improve yeah. that. You know, when you say that, the last year or so, I've been doing yoga and Pilates. Uh huh. And they, and I know when you do that, they'll they'll, they'll have you mobilize your your yes. pelvis. Is, is that kind of That's somewhat kind like of what that? we do a lot of, I encourage a lot of yoga type techniques. We talk about tucking the tail underneath and lifting the great big dinosaur tail up in the air and, you know, enhancing that mobility there. Because again, so much of what we do is core. Pelvic floor is part of our core. So we keep going back to that core, you know, get that core stability, get that core flexibility, learn your core, use that core and then do movement yeah. beyond that. Yeah, I like that. Good. Thanks, Pam. I'm going to, I think Lindsay's up next. We're going to have Lindsay ask, uh, answer a question here. Hello. You guys have tough words to say. So I'm going to try <laughs> another, another couple words here, Lindsay. Okay. All right. What are dyspareunia and veg vaginismus? Yep. Uh, did I do okay with those? You did. Okay. All right. What are they and what can your, your team do to help with these conditions? Yeah. So, you know, sometimes these can be sensitive things to talk about for patients. So it can be uh, uncomfortable for patients to bring it up, but they are very important. You know, uh, sexual activity is a big part of people's lives. So with dyspareunia, that would be pain with attempted or complete vaginal penetration. Okay. And so what can happen with that? Patients could get pain with uh, pelvic exams or with intercourse and it can be experienced anywhere along that vaginal canal either right at the opening part way through or even deeper and so with therapy there's different treatment techniques that we can do so one could be teaching patients to use appropriate lubrication uh, different positioning techniques and you can even bring in patients partners too to help with that instruction okay and we can teach different relaxation techniques. A lot of times those tissues are tight or those muscles are too tense and we need that relaxation. 
So there's different tools we can use like dilators or pelvic wands and therapists can do more like external and internal techniques for stretching of the tissues. And it's important to teach the patients that so that okay. they have that ability to do the stretching at home too. Okay. And there's different ways to use ice and heat for pain control as well uh, if they're experiencing pain. And then on the other hand, vaginismus would be where there's that incomplete ability to enter that uh, vaginal canal. And usually it's when those pelvic floor muscles are just very tense. Okay. So a lot of times we work externally trying to calm down those muscles with relaxation, uh, different techniques that, again, we can use in therapy and teach those patients to do at home as well, and then work more internally if we need to. And a lot of times if they're st you know having pain, then you go back towards more of that dyspareunia treatment as well and use some of those techniques. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I, I, it's not a, I guess it's not really an understatement to say that, that is a, some of these things are pretty big deals. And I've had some patients that have had these issues. And yep. um, yeah, to have the resource of someone like yourself who can take the time and have some treatment options um, can be really really life-changing uh, oh, yeah. i would think for some people very much so yep i've got to think you've had folks that have come to you that you know like were not in a good place and through the, through that therapy were able to kind of feel some yeah freedom or whatever you want to say definitely because some patients you know they'll avoid wanting to have a female pelvic exam or they'll avoid wanting to participate in intercourse with you know their significant other and, you know, that's a big deal. And so yeah. working on different techniques can be really helpful. Yeah, good. Well, thanks, Lindsay. Um, I'm, I'm going to uh, go to back to Pam here uh, on our folks to talk with. Okay, so uh, Pam, I want to talk fecal incontinence, fecal impaction, and constipation. I was going to say the three F's, but it's two F's and a C. <laughs> the two F's and a C. <laughs> All right. You want to talk about what you guys do to help, what you ladies do to help uh, patients who have these issues? Yes. Yeah, so basically what we're talking about is we're talking about pooping. And, um, you know, you're, you're we like to have... simplify things, don't you, Pam? You get it right down to the. That's right. That's yeah. right. <laughs> we, we say it as it is here, you know. Um, yeah. A lot of times this is really difficult for people to talk about. Right. You know, and. Um, the hard part is there's no norms because we don't talk about it. Nobody knows what's what's normal. This is normal for me, you know, and um, many times um, you usually see like more of the constipation issues a lot of times, especially when people are younger. And then sometimes that can lead more to fecal incontinence, which is the loss of bowel movements with, you know, unconsciously sort of thing. So. Um, what we do is we teach people what positions to poop in. So, you know, we should be bent forward. Ideally, you know, before we had toilets, we would all squat on the ground to, to poop. And that's how our bodies were designed to have a bowel movement. And so oftentimes we keep making toilets higher or we kind of hover over top of a toilet because we don't want to sit on that toilet, you know. And what happens is we are using our pelvic floor muscles to help hold us into that position. Um, if you've ever watched a little kid learning to go to the bathroom and they're sitting on there trying to balance and not fall into the toilet, they're using their pelvic floor to hold them up. And oftentimes they can't go to the bathroom in that position because they're working so hard trying to stay on the toilet. Okay. And as soon as they're able to relax those pelvic floor muscles, then they can go. So we try to find like, you know, could we use a stool? There's a thing called a squatty potty. Get your feet elevated, lean forward as though you're looking like you're in a deep squat position and it allows you to go a, a little bit more. We have to learn to open the door rather than close the door. And oftentimes people will strain to have a bowel movement and that straining, they're actually, you know, we talked about pelvic floor contractions and people doing kegels incorrectly. Oftentimes people think they're opening the door and they're actually keggling and hmm. pushing that that fecal matter back into the the rectum when when they think they're pushing down we shouldn't have to strain to go to the bathroom it should be more of a relaxation thing our push should be from the diaphragm kind of thinking open and pushing i just kind of lost my connection here you're good. Um, you're good. hopefully you can still see me 
Yep, I can still see you. Um, <laughs> but um, yeah, so so we want to work on on teaching people to do that. Now, as far as fecal incontinence, oftentimes what will happen is someone has perhaps had constipation for so much of their life that um, their their rectum has become desensitized and they can't really tell that they need to go to the mm -hmm. bathroom. Um, so we work on working on getting them a complete bowel movement that enables them to let, have less of an issue as far as um, it, they don't have to strain so much and they allow their rectum to kind of resense what they're doing again and they have a better concept of what's in there and can can hold back that we also teach kegels to kind of help hold that back and kind of learning to control those muscles a little bit better as well yeah yeah thank you pam that's that's really a good explanation um helps me understand it better what you're trying to accomplish so thanks mm -hmm. um morgan uh, thanks pam i'm gonna have morgan yep. hop on here um we're gonna talk pregnancy now mm -hmm. all right so how can how do you help women um both like during and after pregnancy yeah there is so much that we can do um and we have wonderful resources here that can really help these moms through pregnancy and postpartum um women's bodies change so much in such a short amount of time um, you know, the muscles are all stretching, ligaments are softening, our posture is coming forward and just so abnormal from how we've moved before. It's no wonder we have so much pain and discomfort. Um, but, you know, labor and delivery is a marathon. Um, it's a marathon, but you would never not train for a marathon and you would never not understand what you're going into um, and how to recover. And so that's a big thing that, you know, we want to help women understand their bodies know how they're moving, what is expected, um, especially when you get into that labor and delivery, speaking on those kegels again, you know, if we're doing them backwards, we want that to go as fluid as possible and um, for women to feel as confident as possible um, through that process. Um, so physical therapy can really help women increase their activity, um, decrease pain, which is seen a lot, pelvic girdle pain, low back pain, um, give you some more tools to prepare and excel to minimize that core and pelvic floor impairment. Um, if you were somebody that wasn't really engaged in that and understood, um, and give you more of an understanding of how to recover or how to turn all of those muscles back on. Um, it's estimated, uh, University of Iowa did a big study with 25,000 women, uh, that one in three women have a pelvic floor disorder that stems from pregnancy and birth. That can happen immediately, you know, with some incontinence or a prolapse, or it can show years and decades down the road. Mm. Um, and it's taboo. Mothers put themselves last and don't discuss it like we've talked about with a lot of these topics. Um, but we're really trying to kind of break that barrier. And, um, you know, all of the providers here, we're, we have so much to offer. And we just want to women to feel more confident talking um, about these problems and getting the help that, that they need. Um, there's a lot that can be done down the road and whether it's six weeks after birth or 20 years, you know, there's, a, there's a lot of resources. Sure. So Morgan, I guess the question in my mind is, is every pregnant woman supposed to come see you or who, who are the women that are the, that either yeah need to, they would be a good fit to come to yeah. you. In a perfect world, I would love that, you know, just to give somebody another eye on, um, to make sure things are going right. If, but not everybody, you know, if you're women that are experiencing pain, women that have some questions, um, women that had um, a third or fourth degree perineal tear or um, okay. problems with the birth, if you had a really long um, second stage of labor, um, that maybe there's some dysfunction here, um, incontinence, you know, I love to see people, we love to see people postpartum, especially to get those muscles turning back on so we don't have those problems long-term or less likely. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, there's, especially just to get an evaluation, make sure things are going well, ask your questions. Um, I think it's wonderful to have just another set of eyes on that mom. Yeah, appreciate that. Yeah, um, that's, a, that's a good question that we took on today. So thank you. Um, I'm gonna have Lindsay um, answer a question here. Uh, 
pelvic organ prolapse, and I'll let you define that in a second here, Lindsay, is pretty common. Um, what is it and what can you do to help? Okay. So pelvic organ prolapse can occur when one or more of the vaginal walls descends or moves down. So some examples could be like a cystocele where our bladder would push against the front wall of the vagina or a rectocele where the rectum could push against the back wall of the vagina. And this can cause feelings of like something falling out, that vaginal pressure, uh, low back aches, and it can cause bleeding or discharge. And then just again, that pelvic pressure is really a big thing. Uh, different causes and contributing factors could be vaginal childbirth, um, increased pressures within the abdomen, and that could be like straining. So especially with heavier lifting or straining to have a bowel movement. And then estrogen deficiencies and if there's different connective tissue disorders. So if there's hypermobility, if tissues move a little too much, that can cause that wall to push in and go down. Uh, physical therapy can be helpful for prolapse and a lot of it's education uh, for prolapse, especially in the beginning. So teaching different strategies for bowel techniques, uh, just like Pam had mentioned, uh, teaching, you know, less straining, mm -hmm. okay? controlling more of those abdominal pressures so that you're not bearing down and pushing down and holding your breath. Uh, that goes along with lifting strategies as well. Uh, teaching different urination strategies, um, and then teaching exercises per, for pelvic floor. So that could be strengthening exercises, and then also working with the core. Like I think Pam had mentioned the core earlier as well, but it's really important to have that pelvic floor, which is part of the core, work together with the other structures so that there's not that increased abdominal pressure causing that pushing and bearing down. Okay, very yeah. good. Very good. Um, I'm going to switch it up a little bit because we're getting towards the end of our time here. And um, I, I'm going to switch down. I'm going to have Pam come on if I could. And Pam, I just want to give um, one uh, question more targeted towards men. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so let's talk about what, what can, what can you do? What can pelvic health, health therapists do? for men, particularly with prostate related issues like um, incontinence, they don't, the stream's not real good, they strain, or they have maybe some retention. Can you talk about that? A little yeah, bit? So, so men have a pelvic floor too. Um, you know, we always talk about women's pelvic floors and um, it, they're generally not as aware of their pelvic floor because they don't have to utilize it quite as often as women do. And so what, what oftentimes happens is, um, so if we're talking prostate, the prostate can become enlarged and it kind of impinges on that urethra. Um, men are pretty dependent on that prostate to kind of help them with continence anyway. It kind of, the urethra kind of takes a turn. And so you don't have to think so much about retaining fluid as much as women do um, because the prostate helps out with that, but it can also impede what, when they're, when they're urinating. So what we do with that is we can't, you know, we can't change the size of that. That's kind of what you docs do, but mm -hmm. um, you know, you kind of help with that. But what we can do is kind of assess posture and, and the ability to relax that pelvic floor and learning how to do that. Um, if you, if you imagine um, a man standing to urinate, you know, they tend to kind of tuck the hips underneath. You kind of as, assume that kind of extended posture. Why is that? Because we relax our pelvic floor better in that position. Now you, you add age related events, which is usually, you know, the people who have enlarged prostates, they're tending to be a little bit more forward. <coughs> we teach them to extend or to sit to urinate so they can relax that pelvic floor, use the pelvic floor to open that urethra a little bit more. Then we can have the prostate removed and that often causes incontinence. And why? Because now you don't have the prostate to help and now you have to use a pelvic floor that is weaker, thinner than women's and you have more of a direct route to, to empty. So we have to teach now some strengthening things how to engage that pelvic floor, how to use posture and core to strengthen those muscles and um, strategies to prevent that incontinence as well as the water intake and everything we talked about earlier with urine retent or, you know, urine incontinence. Yeah, good. 
Very good. Um, uh, one quick follow-up question to that. Mm -hmm. What percentage of, 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 would you say of, and let's get everybody on the screen if we don't, if you don't mind. Okay. Um, what, what percentage of your, of your patients would you say are women versus uh, men? Ooh, I'd say probably 80 to 90%, wouldn't you? Yeah, I've, okay. I've had some men as patients. Um, you know, we can deal with erectile dysfunction as well and different yeah. things like that. But yeah. I think sometimes I get them di by default on seeing them for something else and then we start yeah. working on public health too. Sure. And I guess one other thing I was just thinking about as we're talking about a lot of these um, questions or things that people, we've kind of said again and again, people don't like to talk about, or yeah. it's just not part of normal conversation because um, people may be um, embarrassed or feel some shame about whatever is going on there. Um, is that pretty, is that part of the process when uh, patients come in for the first time often? And is that uh, pretty common that you have to work through that? Um, when someone comes in for one of these conditions? I, I think so. You know, you do have some people who are really uncomfortable with it. And I think that's probably why we don't see as many men other than the fact that, you know, women have babies and, and we tend to, you know, that see those. True. But we're also a little bit more willing to talk about it. Whereas a man has an issue, you yeah. know, sometimes they don't. Yeah, yeah. And we want to make it as comfortable as possible. So every evaluation is different. You know, it's patient specific. We really do a lot, a lot of education and talking. Um, yes, we do the internal exams when we deem it appropriate. Um, and when, you know, we feel that it, they're comfortable and we're comfortable with it. Um, but on the men's side as well, we catch a lot when they're not here for a pelvic health problem and we just get in discussing this with low back and hip pain. Oh, interesting. Okay. Yeah. There, there's a lot that can be caught or little problems. Um, and then we get referrals in from that direction as well. Yeah. I think it's important to note too, that some of the patients that we get, there's a psychological aspect to it also. Some of those conditions um, might have previous histories of maybe like sexual abuse or, you know, anything like that. And so you have to build some trust there. And so it's even harder for them, I feel like, to come forward and talk to anybody about those kinds of things. Yeah, yeah that's a good point. Well, I hope for folks who are listening, who have taken the time to listen to this uh, conversation with, with the four of you, um, have taken from this that, um, you know, there's there's no shame in any of these conditions. Um, our team is here to help and can help you um, and um, seek them out. And it's, yeah, it's just a, one of those top, I, I actually, we started even talking about having this conversation when I was over at your office and I was talking to, to, uh, to Morgan and uh, Pam a little bit about it. And we kind of like, we're going, uh, like, yeah, you know, this is something that we just haven't had a chance to, highlight much. So I'm glad that was probably, that was a, your Christmas party. So it's been a while <laughs> since we've gone from that conversation to this one, but I'm glad we did. Mm -hmm. um, Pam, Morgan, Lindsay, and Liz, thank you so much for what you do uh, for pelvic health um, for our patients. And thanks for taking the time to have, do an interview with, with me. Thank, thank, you. You. thank you. All right. Take care. All right, so I have um, a f just a few things I wanted just to mention before I let you go. And I think we're gonna get those up in just a second here. So first of all, I wanna uh, um, give a shout out to the our employee of the month, to Kaylin King. Uh, she's a receptionist up on the third floor of our main clinic. And she helps out with, um, both, with family practice, urology, and surgery. So she's a, a, a busy woman. There are three receptionists up there, but Kaylin uh, is the one that received the Employee of the Month for this month. So congratulations to Kaylin. Uh, Ready Care. Yeah, I just wanted to make sure you know that walk-ins are welcome anytime. We've kind of re revamped that. And if it's, it's, we wouldn't mind if you call, let us know you're coming uh, and get an appointment set up, but you don't have to. So just want to make sure that that, is a, that that is how we're doing things now down at Ready Care. And those are the hours that we're that we have at the moment. So why don't you make sure you're aware of that? Ah, yes. And actually this will be, um, this will be coming up when, when I 
have our next Facebook Live, um, which I'm going to have Liz go to the next screen. <laughs> and that's Dr. Monty. So Dr. Monty is going to be with us in a, in a few weeks, in a couple of weeks. And Dr. Monty is one of our GI docs. And one of the things we'll probably talk about is that now uh, I'm reading this and, and the literature is out there that people are um, being diagnosed with colon cancer at younger ages. And so uh, they've moved the, it used to be forever, it was 50 years to get your first colonoscopy. Now it's 45. So we'll talk about that with Dr. Monty and I, that slide previous kind of mentioned that as well. So that's the next time that we get together will be March 23rd and we'll have Dr. Monty on to talk about um, all things of digestive health. Okay, so yeah, thanks for taking the time to listen in. I, I, I just mentioned this briefly, but we started doing these about three years ago, uh, about a week from now um, when the pandemic hit. And obviously we've transitioned from talking about pandemic related things, just the things that are health related that we think would be helpful for folks that may, we may, you may not hear much about in your day-to-day -day lives. So I hope that that's the case, that we've transitioned into a, a broadcast that gives you information and helps you to think about things that are related to your health that uh, that we have services for here to help you here in our community at cgh so thanks for watching uh, i will look forward to having an interview with dr monty and i'll be back in a couple weeks thanks